As we mentioned off the top this evening, it's not just on land, it's the temperatures they're seeing in the water too. Right off Florida tonight, evidence of the changing climate. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z. Ocean temperatures are warming at an unprecedented rate, with 40% of global oceans currently experiencing a heat wave. Reaching potentially, it's a key word here, record breaking levels. It's going to be ramping up with scenes like this unfolding today in the the last six to seven years. Heating up, hitting record breaking levels. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We've actually seen a circumpolar wide response. Ocean surface temperatures spiked in April and May to the highest levels recorded since the 1950s. Everywhere, the ice season was greatly short. It's uh, all around the world at the moment. This climate mode has kind of clicked in. Why are we seeing those increases, and what should we understand about that? We, we just keep creating one record after another. 2017, that was record low. Dangerous heat wave. Again in 2022, all time record low. A massive winter storm system. 2023, even more of a record low. We are scrambling trying to understand that and is this something that's going to persist? What are the feedbacks in the system? I'm Sharon Stammerjohn. I study sea ice. I will never forget my first experience when I was a graduate student in 1999 when I got to walk on the frozen ocean. You put the gangplank down onto the frozen ocean, you walk off the ship, and we had a ton of what we call frost flowers. It's these little ice crystals, and you're crunching on all these ice flowers, and they're just so beautiful and intricate and you walk a little bit of ways to put up your instrumentation. And I looked back at the ship and it's doing this. So there's a swell. We were hundreds of kilometers inside the ice edge. And yet there's this long period swell. So oh, am I going up and down? And you wouldn't know unless you had something to see on the horizon that gave you some indication. That is amazing. So right there, you just feel it in your bones. Oh, I'm on this very flexible, sensitive, thin layer between the atmosphere and the ocean that makes all the difference in the world to our polar regions and to our climate. And I was just, that was it, that's all it took. I was completely hooked. The ice cover that forms every winter, it's one of the largest seasonal changes anywhere on the planet. Mid-February is the midsummer, the lowest sea ice of the season and then it starts to cool down and the sea ice starts to grow and then the ice can expand and reach its maximum around September. It's a huge change and it profoundly affects the atmospheric circulation as well as the ocean below it. The Southern Ocean plays a big role in regulating global heat and carbon dioxide. 90% of the heating globally that has been added to the atmosphere through greenhouse gas increases is taken up by the oceans. And two thirds of that 90% is taken up by the Southern Ocean. The global air temperatures would be a lot warmer if it weren't for that heat sink by the oceans. Antarctic sea ice has global significance to our climate. And for example, it's freezing nearly fresh water at the surface when it's forming, the ice excludes most of the salts. And so that salt that gets left behind sinks in the water column. That ends up becoming Antarctic bottom water, an extremely dense water mass, and that flows off these continental shelves into the ocean abyss. And this is the main driver of deep ocean circulation and the ocean's ability to take up heat and its ability to absorb carbon dioxide. Thermo means heat, and hailing means salt. And the coldest, saltiest water in the ocean is also the densest water and the most likely to sink. When water leaves the surface of the ocean, it has a particular temperature and salinity, and it retains that same temperature and salinity as it moves through the interior of the ocean because there's very little mixing down there. 
The thermohaline circulation is a large conveyor belt that stretches out across the global ocean from the surface to the deep, from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. And that conveyor belt starts in the North Atlantic where warm water flows northward at the surface in a current that we know of as the Gulf Stream. And that warm water, as it moves northward, it loses heat to the atmosphere and it cools. It's also very salty. So once it reaches these really high latitudes near Greenland, it tends to sink because it becomes very dense and it moves that water all the way down to the interior of the ocean. It becomes something called North Atlantic deep water. And then that water flows at depth to the southern part of the world, down toward Antarctica. Some of it resurfaces in Antarctica. Otherwise, it continues on through the deep Indian Ocean all the way up through the deep North Pacific where it then returns as a surface current, completing the loop back in the North Atlantic. It takes about 1,600 years for that full cycle to complete. So once water sinks in the North Atlantic, it doesn't resurface at that same point until about 1,600 years later. So that thermal helium circulation is responsible for absorbing and storing a tremendous amount of heat and carbon that's to be sequestered for centuries in the deep ocean. We know so little about the ocean. We know less about the ocean than we do about Mars that there's these great mysteries still to be solved about how interconnected the ocean is to the climate system. So for example, the water in the North Atlantic is sinking because it's dense, but also because on the other end of the world, winds and buoyancy forcing are driving North Atlantic deep water to be sucked back up to the surface, where it can then either move northward or southward. As it moves northward in the surface of the ocean, it absorbs man-made carbon dioxide. It then sinks northward of where it surfaced and it brings with it that carbon dioxide into the interior of the ocean where it can be locked away for hundreds of years. It's additional really if that upwelling of water moves southward it's transformed into the Antarctic bottom water. If we aren't able to form as much ice around the Antarctic continent because it's warmer than it otherwise was, Antarctic bottom water processes may slow and that's important because that's part of the pull on the North Atlantic deep water and the entire global thermohaline circulation. That would have drastic consequences for the atmosphere. What we've more or less been seeing over the satellite errors on the time period when we had continuous near daily observations and that started around 78, 79. We've been seeing a small increase in Antarctic sea ice up until about 2016. So why did we have this like 40 year increase in sea ice? Antarctic sea ice is primarily wind driven. Uh, when wind blows over the ice cover, the wind stress will tend to push it north. Westerly winds intensify as the planet warms up. And so that actually helped expand out the sea ice. But if you start to look at the spatial patterns, we were seeing these very strong regional trends. They averaged out to a net overall increase. But west of the peninsula, you're getting a three month decrease in the ice season. Suddenly those marine ecosystems that were halfway up the peninsula that had a healthy winter with plenty of sea ice, suddenly they were like a maritime system. And a lot of that was because you had intensified these warm winds from the north. And so these warm winds would really spin up. Not only are you bringing in warm air, but these storms would come through on a weekly basis. And the waves and the winds break up the newly formed sea ice and it just keeps it southward. In general, these intensifying winds, it explains the sea ice trends up until about 2016. And we see that relationship really clearly. And now 2016, it goes straight down that was perplexing because the winds were still intensifying, which was part of that increasing story of sea ice. But what's been going on all along is this increase in ocean heat content below the area where sea ice is growing and melting every year. Every decade, the ocean is warmer than the previous decades. If you want to talk about a tipping point, that is a possible threshold that we have crossed where that wind-driven forcing to brought more ocean heat closer to the surface. And so now less sea ice is grown because the ocean is that much warmer. The oceans are reaching capacity to offset the carbon and all that additional heat. It's affecting the global oceans, it's affecting the marine ecosystems globally everywhere, but 
What is alarming is how that affects the atmosphere and the ocean circulation. You can suddenly create a domino effect. We're not going to change that overnight. The better you know the problem, the better you can predict it, the better you know the rate of change, the better you can adapt, the better you can mitigate. And that's where we are. We have to mitigate. We have all the technology in place to solve the climate crisis right now. Realistically, we know there's only one way to solve this problem, and that is to slow or stop our emissions of greenhouse gases. We can do that. Solar energy, the controversial nuclear energy, we can simply switch from using coal-fired power plants to using natural gas. That already cuts our emissions in half. We can increase the miles per gallon on every vehicle that we drive. We can ensure that everything that we build now is the most energy efficient building we could think of. We can install LEDs in place of CFLs. That's already a huge reduction in emissions. You'd be surprised. We currently emit about 10 petagrams of carbon every year. So by changing our light bulbs, we could reduce that by, you know, 10%. There are no insurmountable technological or scientific reasons why we can't do this. However, there are very few economic incentives in place to do this. Without that economic incentive, it becomes very hard for us to want to switch to these newer and often more expensive sources of energy. Our governments need to put an economic incentive in place. We know exactly what to do. We know exactly how to solve this problem. We just need to get together and solve it.